What's up, everyone? Welcome to CCV. We're so glad you joined us today. Why don't we stand to our feet? We're going to start off singing our praise to our God for His faithfulness and His goodness in our lives. Come on. Over and over, time and again, you have been faithful in my distress. Never fails, your grace never ends. Troubles may come, this my song, even when I'm standing tall on your promises. All right. No matter the season, no matter what we're walking through, our God is faithful. Declare it. Come on. Whatever may come, whatever may pass, I'll stand on this rock. You're my confidence. Whatever may come, whatever the cost, I'm standing tall on your promises. Whatever may come, whatever may pass, I'll stand on you're my confidence Whatever may come Whatever the cost I'm standing tall On your promises Standing tall On your promises Oh, 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 oh. I'm standing tall On your promises Your love never fails your grace never ends. Troubles may come, this my song, even when I'm standing tall on your promises. Sing, I'm standing tall on your promises. Your love never fails, your grace never ends. Troubles may come, this my song, till the end. I'm standing tall on your promises. I'm standing tall on your promises. Misses. Standing on the promises of God All my life I'll stand yeah. I am standing tall oh. of all creation He's been good through all the ages For sure pull He never changes He never changes He's the God who moves the mountains He's the God who moves the mountains And He reconciles, reconciles the broken hearted And 
and in Him we found redemption, redemption. So together we sing that chorus, we sing glory to the one. Glory to the one who holds it all. Glory to the one who saved my soul. You are the only one worthy of our praise. All honor and all glory is due to you and to you alone. God, we claim our dependence on you today. Hear us as we make this our prayer. Come on, let's sing it together. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses Yes, I am The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me yeah. I 
and he's good to do it. Let's sing this out to him. This is our cry. Sing. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Yes, we are. Yeah. I'm calling on to God and Mary. Yeah. The rest upon the Lord. I know with you all things are possible I'm calling on the God of David Who made a shepherd boy courageous That's what he does I may not face Goliath But I've got my own giants Oh God, my God to declare that truth in this place today the same God that we sing to today is the same God that has been with us he is with us now and he will never change and continue to be with us in the future amen amen thanks so much for declaring that with us 
Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? Well, in the early 1900s, there was a now well-known explorer named Ernest Shackleton. And he led several expeditions down to Antarctica. And these expeditions have been well-documented as some of the most dangerous journeys that humans have, have ever taken, often leading to, to tragedy and death. But leading into to one of these trips... The story goes that Shackleton found out that he needed more men to go with him on the journey. So he ended up taking an ad out in a London newspaper that said this, said men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Not the most appealing plea when recruiting somebody to join you on your team. I mean, who in their right mind would sign up for something like this? But the response to this ad actually shocked everybody. See, the story goes that over 5,000 men responded to this ad, wanting to join Shackleton and his team to go down to Antarctica. Why? Why would so many people sign up for something like this? See, what I think it shows us is, this, is the same thing I think is the reality in many of our lives, is that we don't want our lives to be full of comfort and ease. What we really want our lives to be is significant and to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And nobody modeled this better for us than Jesus Christ did. See, as the Son of God, he he could have chosen comfort, but he didn't. Instead, he chose pain and suffering and death. Why? He chose those things for two reasons, obedience and love. Obedience to God the Father and love for you. Every week we have the opportunity to take communion together where we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for every single one of us that wasn't comfortable, but it was purposeful. See, it was through this sacrifice that we were able to to find forgiveness for all of our sins and he made a payment for us. And so over these next few moments, I invite all followers of Jesus to use this time to not only remember his sacrifice, but remember how his commitment to God and his love for you actually were more important than his comfort. Father, as we enter into this time of communion, we're, we just wanna say thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, we know you, you didn't make it so that we would be comfortable, but you made it so we would be obedient. Thank you for modeling that for us bless this time and just reveal to us how you want to use our lives for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So many 
songs that we sung. But how could I praise you enough? So here's another one. Why, I, 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 you love me like you love me? I'll never know. Why, I, 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 you love me like you love me? Your love is better than silver, better than gold. Better than anything I've ever known, I'll never know Why, I, 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 you love me Like you love me, I'll never know One thing that you should know today, it's that God loves you. I mean, he's like head over heels for you. And if you ever ask yourself why, kind of like that song, just know this, that God's love for you isn't dictated by your performance. It's based on his character. It's who he is. God is love. And you know, our, our vision as a church is to get that message to every part of our city. In fact, our vision as a church is to reach the entire valley for Christ. And it's a big vision but we have a big God. Two years ago, thinking about that vision, I began to get a burden in my heart that I, I couldn't shake. And it was this, that it's really hard for us to say that we're reaching our entire valley for Jesus when we're not at the center of our city, at the heart of our city in downtown Phoenix. Now there's a lot, not a lot of churches downtown and the reason why is primarily because it's really hard to do ministry down there, but we have no excuse as a church to go every place God is calling us because where much is given, much is required, right? And so I cannot tell you how excited I am to tell you that 
Two years ago over the pandemic, an opportunity came up for us to, to get an amazing property downtown at a really good deal. And so this Easter, we will launch our 15th CCV campus, CCV downtown. Here's a, here's a picture of what it looks like. Um, we, we, got a, we got a historic building downtown right in the heart of the downtown warehouse district. It's right next to where the D-backs play, where the Phoenix Suns are at. It's in the heart of our city. And I just think God is on the move down there. And so I want us to pray for that campus as we start today, but I also want to introduce you and pray for our campus pastor who's going to go down there. So would you help me welcome Dan Starks, his wife Jess to the stage right now. These, um, these two have a story that we're, we're going to tell your story someday because it's an incredible story. But Dan's been on in, in ministry for over 10 years now. He's went through our CCV residency program where we develop leaders. And he's been for the past year on our Verado campus. Shout out to our Verado campus, everybody out there. He's done an incredible job out in Verado. And they would both tell you this, that they think all these years of everything you've been through, God's been preparing you to go downtown. And... We believe that as well, and so we're launching them. And what I want us to do today is I want us to pray for them, for the staff and the volunteers of that campus. And just know this, if you wanna get involved down there, you know someone that lives down there, you can get online and get on our interest list because God is gonna create a revival downtown and these two are gonna help lead the charge. And so would we pray for them right now? Would you just join me? God, I thank you for Dan and Jess and all that you've done in their lives to prepare them for this moment. And as a church, we just wanna pray your blessing over them. Would you protect their marriage? Would you walk, watch over their kids? Would you bring the right staff and volunteers? And Father, we pray for a revival in our city. And would it start in the heart of our city? And with this new campus, just see a movement of people giving their lives to Jesus and for discipleship to happen in that part of our city. And we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. And we all said, amen. Amen. Would you help, the, help thank these guys one more time? Thank you, Dan and Jess. We love you guys. <clears throat> well, as we continue our series All In, this is week three, and the title of the message today is You're Indispensable. You're Indispensable. Do you know that? Now, have you ever been in a setting where you feel the exact opposite? Um, like you're not needed maybe at all. Uh, this happened to me last year. Um, I told you over Christmas that my oldest daughter got married. And if you've ever prepared for a wedding, there's all these details for the wedding. I mean, our house is a flurry of activity, right? I mean, we're, we're picking out colors when I say we, right? We're picking out colors and candles and cakes and dresses and flowers and all this is going on and I'm, I'm stepping back and I'm kind of looking at everything and I'm like, I don't think they need me at all. Like when it comes to my qualifications and all this, I'm qualified to like taste the cake. Do you want me to taste the cake and see if the cake is good? Like I like cake, I guess that's what I can offer. I really felt unneeded. Now, the more questions I asked and the more I got involved, I realized, no, I was crazy needed. Uh, primarily my pocketbook because weddings are very, very expensive. But no, really, I, I had to dive in and serve in so many areas, and I really love doing it, but I just want you to feel this. There was a time where I didn't think they needed me at all. I think that's how so many of us feel when it comes sometimes to the church, especially a church like CCV. I mean, some of you, you look around this church, and here's what you think. What would they need me for? I mean, this thing looks like a well-oiled machine. I've heard people say that to me before. Or like, you know, some of you think like, I just, you know, someone must just step on this campus and like flip a switch and it just happens. And what I want you to hear today, if you hear nothing else, is that nothing could be further from the truth. You are indispensable for what God wants to do around here. And I think one of Satan's greatest goals in your life is to convince you when it comes to the church and what you could do contributing is that you're not needed at all. And what I wanna do today is I just wanna open up scripture and I wanna show you with crystal clear clarity that you are indispensable more than you could ever imagine. 
And the way, way I want to do that is I want to turn to a passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians where Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he gives a metaphor for what the church is all about, and this metaphor shows us such clarity on how much we're needed. Here's, here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12. He says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. And so it is with the body of Christ. In other words, the, the metaphor that Paul uses for the church, he says the church is what? It's the body of Christ. It's, it's like a body. And for what Jesus wants to do, it, it, it requires the whole body. Now, when you, when you think about a body, here's what we all know. One part of the body doesn't make up the body. We wouldn't look at a hand and go like, the hand's the body. You know, it's just a hand or the finger. You know, it's like the leg makes up, no, the leg's just a leg. But together, together, we call it a body. And what's amazing about this analogy is when you think about just even what you know, what we know throughout history is um, when a body of people come together, their identity changes based on if it was just an individual. Can I give you some examples just from the animal kingdom? And we can have a little fun today. And if you know the answers, you can shout this out. Um, one lion is called a lion. But if you get a group of lions together, what, what do we call a group of lions? What, if you know it, shout it out loud. What do, what do we call them? Okay, it's a pride. It's a pride. Right? You know, it'll get a little bit harder. One ant, an ant. What is a group of ants called? A colony. Okay, uh, one kangaroo. A kangaroo. What's a group? Anybody know what a group of kangaroos is called? It's actually called a mob. Someone got it, right? Isn't that funny? It's a mob mentality. A bunch of kangaroos jumping around everywhere, right? One donkey. What's a group of donkeys called? Careful with this one, okay? Careful. Okay, careful. We're in church. Let me remind you that, all right? Actually, a group of donkeys is actually called a drove. But remember, the identity changes when it's a group all working together, right? Now, one cat's a cat. What's a group of cats called? Pure evil. Pure evil. I was kidding. I threw that one for you cat lovers out there. You know how much I love you. No, actually, this is actually, I didn't know this. A group, a group of cats is called a clouder, okay? Dumbest name ever, but that's what they're called, all right? That's what they're called. Um, my favorite one is probably this. What is a group of horses called? a team or a herd. And what God can do with a team of people together is beyond what you could imagine with just one individual. Now let's, let's apply it to us, the church. One follower of Jesus is called what? Called a Christian. Right? We can call him a Christian. There's other, other terms, but one follower of Jesus might be a Christian. What is a group of Christians gathered together called? Or the church. And Paul tells us this analogy, the church is the body of Christ. And together, we, the body of Christ, were designed to go change the world. Some of you look around our world and you don't like what you see going on in our world. Listen, what is going to change a world is not a political system or an economic solution. What's going to change the world is when the church, the body of Christ, steps up to do what God's called us to do, amen? So here, here, here's what the analogy, right? We're the body of Christ, and you have to understand, in the body, you are indispensable. Now, our initial reaction, some of us, to that idea that we might be indispensable is we'd say this, me? Come on. Like, I, I would be such a small part of what goes on around here. I'm not even qualified. I'm not even sure, like, I would even make a difference. But I love the analogy of the body of Christ because when you think about your body, think about the diversity and how many little small parts up make up the whole, right? I mean, you have the forehead, you have a little nose, you've got, you know, eyebrows, eyelids, eyelashes. Some of you have really long eyelashes, right? We've got ears, ear lobes, little fingers, little toes. Some of us feel like, well, I'd just be so small. I wouldn't matter. It's almost like Paul can can read our minds because he says this. And I like how the message translation puts it. Verse 12, verse 14, he says, I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and doing what? Functioning together. 
He goes on to say this. Again, it's a message translation. It's kind of funny. He says, if the foot says, I'm not elegant like the hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to the body. Would that make it so? We would say, well, no. Well, if the ear says, I'm not beautiful like the eye, like I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove your ear from the body? We'd say, well, that's dumb. And yet, that's exactly what some of us do with the church. We say, well, I'm just a little small, like I'm insignificant. I don't even know if I matter. And what do we do? We end up elevating some roles in the church like they're ultra important and the church is all about that. I'll use my role as an example. Some of you around here, you look at my role and you say, well, well, that's the most important role. I can promise you it's not true. In fact, Paul says it. He says this in verse 19. For no matter how significant you are in the body, it is only because you're a part of it. Let that sink in for a moment. It doesn't matter how significant the role in the body of Christ, me, someone on your campus, music team, the only significance is because we're part of the body. Without the body, nothing matters. Like my role is completely insignificant. And did you know statistically, someone makes up their mind when they come to a church, whether they will ever come back before they ever walk in the doors and hear the message? Do you know that? So what, what does that say? It matters that every single role, the, the parking lot, what happens in the parking lot, and our volunteers out there, unbelievably important. When someone steps on the campus and feeling welcomed and feeling like there's a smiling face and someone that's there to help them and show them where to go or maybe get them a cup of coffee or show them in the kids' ministry. When they walk in the kids' ministry, that you know, it doesn't smell. There's not dirty diapers everywhere, right? And they walk in and, and it's not an unclean environment. And there's nothing bushly going on around here. All those things matter before they ever walk in and ever hear music or a message or the things that we think are really, really important. In fact, Paul goes on to tell us that, that you know what the church would look like if we just elevated one role and made it ultra, ultra important, like that's the end all be all? He says this, an enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a, bo- a body, but what? A monster. You ever seen a horror movie? Big eye. Like, that's a monster. And I wonder if maybe we've done the same thing with the church. You look around the church in America or even around the world, sometimes we've elevated a certain role. The pastor, this team, the music, like that's what matters. No, that's not a body. That's an eye that becomes monstrous. And that's why this church can never, ever, ever be about me or any role around here, any person on your campus ever. It's about the body and us working together. That's what the power, in fact, Paul goes on to say this. It's it's not, what we have is one body with many parts, each with its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. I love that. Then he goes on and says, even the most visible roles aren't even the the ones that matter the most. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are what? Say it out loud. Indispensable. That's our word. You are indispensable to the body of Christ. So first thing I want you to hear today is this. Every person serving somewhere matters for us being a thriving church. And if you're not serving today, I'm just gonna boldly call you to be a part of the body of Christ because we need you. And we don't just need you, you need it. You'll see that later on. But I love what he says. He says, sometimes the things we think are like the weaker parts of the body, those are actually the most indispensable. In other words, some parts of the body that seem weakest are actually the most essential. And I think when God made our bodies, because he knew this analogy was going to be in scripture, when God made our bodies, he gave us a bunch of examples just to see. For example, you know, some of us would say like, well, I'm just a little pinky. I'm nothing. Like, I'm not the thumb that's super cool and a pointer finger gets stuff done. Or I'm not going to show you my middle finger. Some of you take a picture. I'm being on social media, you know. Um, I'm not the ring finger. You know, that's really important. I'm just like the little pinky that means nothing around here. Did you know your pinky controls almost half of your grip strength? In fact, other than your thumb, it's the last finger you would ever want to not have. I'm just a little pinky. No, you matter. You're indispensable. You matter more than you can ever, ever imagine. 
Like, ah, that's cool, but like, you know, I mean, no one's around here going like, well, I'm, I'm the armpit hair. I want to be the armpit hair. Anybody want to be the armpit hair? I mean, what, what use does armpit hair have, right? Do you know, scientifically, especially if you're a guy, your armpit hair was designed, it puts off a, a pheromone, which is scientifically proven that it can be attractional to the opposite sex. <laughs> Do you know this? Some of you here today, the only reason you have a spouse is because of your armpit hair. <laughs> Some guy's like, are you serious? <laughs> What's up, girl? How you doing? You know, it's like, uh, listen, you should use deodorant, okay? Don't, like, don't miss what I'm saying. Like, use deodorant. It's just, do you understand? You, your armpit hair has a function. Like, it actually still matters. Every part of the body matters. Some of you are like, well, I'm, but I'm just the tailbone. And some of you are the tailbone, okay? Let's just be honest. You are. You, you ever injured your tailbone? Here, like, gasp in the, because if you've, if you've ever done that, you know. In fact, when I was growing up, um, our family went to this uh, mountain that had snow on it to go sledding, and uh, I grew up really poor, and we, we didn't have money for a sled, so we went sledding with no sleds, right? You know what our sled was? And this, I didn't even think anything of it at the same time. At the time, it's not like an awesome idea. We had trash bags as our sleds. That's what we brought. So my mom is like flying down this, this mountain in a trash bag, and I'll never forget, she hit this massive rock she didn't see in the snow, right on her tailbone, and I'll never forget, as a, as a young child, you know, my, it took my mom almost over a year to be able to even sit down, like, comfortably. Because sometimes you don't understand the value of something until you don't have it. Every single part of the body matters. And I want to tell someone here today, you need to stop worrying about your qualifications. Stop worrying about, why well, it wouldn't matter. In fact, I would say it this way, don't worry about your ability, concentrate on your availability. Can I say that again? Stop worrying about your abilities. Oh, I don't know what I do, I don't, I'm not qualified around here. Just say, God, I'm available. I wanna be a part of the body of Christ. I'm indispensable. God, I'll, I'm available, I'll, use me. If you would do that, you would be blown away about how God wants to use you. My life verse I've shared this in the past, is Ephesians 3.20. Ephesians 3.20 is this prayer from Paul where he says, now to him who's able to do how much more? Immeasurably more with your life than you could ever ask or imagine. Now, how does God do that? Watch this. According to whose power? Oh, it's, it's not my power. It's actually God's power that's at work where? Within me. Now, this is the picture. I love this picture. It's not just your ability, it's God's power working through you is how you do something great in this world. And so we need to stop focusing on, well, what is my power? It's God's power. You just gotta be available. Now, watch how the verse goes on. It says this, it says, to him be the glory where? Say it out loud, say it out loud. Where's God get the glory? In the church, which means God's greatest glory comes when you use your giftings and the power that he wants to flow through you in the body of Christ. And the reason we're not seeing our world change the way it should is because so many people are on the sidelines not being used in the body of Christ. It's time to like wake up. You're indispensable. And listen, just because something is invisible doesn't mean it's not essential. Some of you are like, why? Well, Just because you can't see it sometimes doesn't mean it's not essential. And again, we have a, a great analogy from, from our own bodies. Do you know what the smallest bone is in your body? Does anybody know what the smallest bone is in your body? Anybody? We actually have this really, really small bone in our inner ear you know what it's called? It's called the stapes. Now, the stapes, this little bone, I mean, it's, it's like so small you couldn't imagine. It looks so insignificant. Like, what would it matter 
If we didn't have the stapes, I mean, you can't even barely see it. Without the stapes, you wouldn't even be able to hear me speaking right now without some massive surgery or help. Some of you not being engaged in the body of Christ is why some people aren't hearing the message of Jesus and experiencing Jesus the way they need. That's how indispensable you are. And just because you can't see it, just because it's small, doesn't mean it's insignificant. In fact, there's so many roles that you would never see serving at CCV making a difference. Many of you don't see the the hundreds of volunteers that come in during the week that prepare your campus that you're on right now so you can be there. In fact, if you're a parent and you pick up your child and your child shows you like something they drew or some curriculum that they, they worked on that day and they said, Mom, Dad, you won't believe what I learned about Jesus today. Do you understand that only happened because during the week there was a group of volunteers, hundreds of them that put together our kids' curriculum that ships to all of our campuses? You didn't see it. It doesn't mean it's not insignificant. It doesn't matter beyond what you could ever imagine. Some of you have come to CCV and you've brought a friend with you. And after the service, you went and got something to eat at a grill or a cafe or you got a cup of coffee and you sat down at a table and you had a a spiritually significant conversation with that person that actually was life-changing for them. Do you understand that happened, like part of that reason that happened is because there was someone behind the scenes preparing that meal, someone making a cup of coffee for you that you may have not even noticed. Just because you didn't see it doesn't mean it didn't matter. There's so many people around here that serve in, in roles during the week, our IT team and technology and our marketing teams. Uh, there, there's, there's people behind the scenes right now in production, and that's the only reason our service is happening right now, because there's an army of volunteers, and just because you can't see it doesn't, doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Some of you are in the service right now, and you know who you are because you have a special needs child or adult, and the only reason you can be here is because there's an army of volunteers in our special needs ministry because we care about that community more than you can ever imagine. In fact, we won't launch a campus without a special needs ministry because we want every person to be able to come and experience the hope of Jesus. But you're here because someone's serving. You know you don't see around here? And, and you don't see the army of prayer volunteers we have that pray behind the scenes for our service and your prayer requests. You think that doesn't matter? Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. But every role matters, whether you can see it or not. And there's so many visible roles. I mean, when you drop your kids off in our kids' ministry, you see all of our kids, you know, coaches and volunteers and our student ministry coaches and volunteers. We have people serving as coaches and stars, leading small groups during the week, you know, marriage mentors, financial coaches. I mean, there are so many roles around you. You can even imagine what's required for us to be able to to reach the people that we're reaching, for God to be able to move the way he is in the body of Christ. And what I want you to hear for just a moment is how those people that are serving, how it's impacting their life by just being available to be a part of the body of Christ. Watch this. My name is Louie. I serve in the seventh grade junior high students ministry. I'm Jake and I serve in the coffee shop. I'm Hannah and I'm his wife. We serve together in the coffee shop. My name is Jim. I work in parking guest services. I've been here for five plus years and um, I do it because it has brought me out of my shell per se. My name is Julie Gerritsen and I serve in the nursery on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings too. It's impacted me by the community. You get so much more out of community in serving. It gives me a sense of life, of helping, of serving others. It's very uh, rewarding. For me, I think it's an opportunity to really get plugged in and build like that kind of small church feeling. Um, we have a little family here at the coffee shop that we really like serving with, and it just feels good to, uh, I don't know, meet a lot of people around the church and connect that way. Serving has impacted me working in the nurseries. 
it's me getting to know the parents and letting them know that their child is safe with us. Just being the hands and feet of Jesus has, I can't imagine not serving. I just found that it was so uplifting and fulfilling with all the families and folks that I've met in this crosswalk over the 10 plus years I've been serving. And it's, uh, it's special. Just being connected with, you know, positive people that you know, also are greeters, you know, it helped me out a lot to realize that I do have a purpose and that, you know, I have meaning to life. And to actually feel that every day now is a blessing and very grateful for everyone that I have met, you know, while greeting. I, it really impacts me if I'm having a bad day and just seeing them playing tag, doing the four-year-old fun stuff, games and everything has been so much fun. And also just getting to know the parents and the families and inviting them to church and seeing them every now and then here and there has been amazing. So it's really impacted my life and I've loved what I've been doing over with STARS. I think you should just do it. Get into it, don't hesitate. It's, you're gonna love it and you won't regret it. Uh, do it, you won't regret it. We're, that's what God calls us to do, is to serve one another, especially when, when we're going through um, trials and tribulations in life. I would say do it, you know? Um, you don't know if you don't try. And for me, it was getting that, the message that said, we need servers and here it is all these years later. Like it might seem kind of scary to get yourself out there at first, but every time we're here, we have a lot of fun. And honestly, it's usually my favorite part about the weekend. I, I just wanna personally thank every single uh, volunteer we have at CCV. You're, you're making an incredible difference. Um, and I wanna say to those of you who may not be serving, listen to what they said, just, just, just do it. Not, not just because of the need, because of what God wants to do through you. Because what you heard is the secret of serving is that when you serve, you think, well, I'm gonna give of myself. But in reality, what you do is you end up receiving more than you're giving because that's how God designed it. But I wanna talk to another group of people here today, and it's, it's not that you would say, well, I'm unqualified or I wouldn't make a difference. There's a gr different group of you today, and you know who you are, and you would say this, that's not why I'm, serving. That's not, why I'm not serving. I'm, I'm actually kind of a big deal, Ashley. <laughs> kind of a big deal. Yeah, so in reality, serving's a little bit beneath you. It's like, you know, I've heard, heard people say to me before, they've, they've said something like this, hey, if, there, if there's something really big at the church you need help with, like, let me know. But like, otherwise, like, what are they saying? I'm a big deal. What's interesting is um, Jesus came upon this when, when he was here on earth as well. Uh, what happened in his ministry is, um, you know, he's got a group of disciples and two of his disciples come to Jesus and here's what they say to Jesus. Um, <clears throat> Jesus, we're kind of a big deal. We're a bigger deal than the other guys around here. So we're, like, we're all about your kingdom and all the stuff you're doing. But with your kingdom, like, we'd like to have the top one or two spots. Like, could you, could you guarantee us that? And Jesus uses this as a teaching opportunity. He actually huddles all the disciples together. And he says this. He says, you're thinking the way the world thinks about leadership. You're thinking in terms of power and personal brand and position. And then he says this in Mark chapter 10, verse 43, but among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And then later in the book of John, John captures for us what happens right after Jesus says this. Right after Jesus says this to his disciples, I think without even saying a word, he wrapped a towel around his waist and he got on his knees and he began washing his disciples' feet. And if you were there, you, you could have heard a pin drop. Because the most important person in the room was doing something that no important person in that world would have ever done. And Jesus gets done. It says in verse 12, John 13, 12, it says, when he finished washing their feet, he put it on his clothes and he returned to his place and then he asked them a question. Do you understand what I've done for you? Like, do you understand what I just modeled for you? And I bet you, they, I mean, it's like silence they don't even know what to say. He goes on, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, because I am. In other words, I am the most important person in the room. You know that. 
Verse 14, but now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I modeled for you what I want. 15, now that I've set you an example, you should do as I have done for you. This is the model Jesus showed us. And then he says this, now that you know these things, you will be what? Say it out loud with me. Say it one more time. Now that you know these things, you'll be what? Say it out loud. Some of you, God's greatest blessing is dependent on you becoming a servant, serving. You know this word blessing, it, it actually means a happiness that this world cannot take from you. And what, what probably concerns me as a pastor almost as much as anything when I look around our world right now, especially America, is the rising rates of mental health issues. Anxiety and depression are all-time highs. I'm not a trained psychologist, but I can read the science enough to know this. There's one issue with almost every case of mental health problems in America today, especially when it comes to anxiety and depression, and what is the one commonality? Our brains are over-focused on one thing, and what is that one thing? It's not social media, not politics, I am focused too much, me. I am so focused on me and my problems and my issues, my anxiety, what I have going on. And that's why every study says there's one thing that helps mental health. It's when you start serving. Did you know that? Why? Because it gets your mind off of you. God didn't design for you to think about you as much as you think about you. He designed you to get outside of yourself to serve the way he modeled it. It's how God designed your body. And when you're not serving, your body starts breaking down because you're so focused on you. And God's blessings, I'm telling you, do you understand what's on the line with you serving? Like now, if you would do this, God says, you'll be blessed. In other words, when you start serving, God starts blessing. And that's what some of you are missing in your faith right now. It's why you feel stagnant in your faith. It's why some of us are so apathetic in our faith. You know, you know, when you think about your body, you know, at times when you don't use a part of your body or you sleep on it wrong, you know, it falls asleep. Um, when I was a young boy, I'll never forget the first time this ever happened to me. I, like, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, <sighs> it's dead. <laughs> it's not dead, it's asleep. And God has someone here to wake you up. Like to wake you up because when it comes to the body of Christ, you're apathetic. You're not being used. You know what happens to a body when there's a part of the body, the body of Christ, us, where there's someone in the body of Christ who's apathetic, like you're asleep, the rest of the body has to work harder. Or there's something that happens in the body that's not being done because you're asleep and apathetic. There's parts of our city that are not being reached. There's people that are showing up to one of our campuses. They're not hearing or experiencing Jesus because you're asleep. There's a 10-year-old right now in our kids' ministry who doesn't have a father. There's no father figure in his life. And he's waiting for one of you men to step up so he can have a father figure to look to. There's students every week thinking about taking their life. You know what they need? They don't need someone who's trained in mental health or suicide prevention. Listen, they need help that way too. But you know what they really need? They just need someone that'll care. Tell them they matter. There's people every week that step on our campuses. They're in a darkness. They're in a cloud. And you don't think a smiling face looking at them, greeting them, talking to them matters? You are indispensable. And I'm here to call the body of Christ to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. (laughs) 
1 Corinthians 12, 27, you are Christ's body. It's who you are. You must never forget this. And only as you accept your part of the body does your part mean anything. I want to pray right now that God stirs your heart to not just hear this message and walk away, but to hear this message and do something about it and for you to wake up. God wants to use your life to make a difference in this world through his church, the body of Christ. You are indispensable. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Just thank you for Jesus and how he modeled a different way to live And I I just feel compelled right now. I know there's someone here today, they've been so focused on them, me. I get that way, God. I see it in my own life, how I focus so much on me and my needs and my weekend and my time. And would you just wake us up today? Help us understand that when we start serving the way you served, God, that's when we are blessed the way you want us to be blessed. It's the way our world changes. It's the way people find Jesus. It's the way the body of Christ functions the way you want it to function. And I just pray today for an awakening in our church so that there's a revival in our city. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and all of us said, amen. Hey, I want you to hear from your campus how you can get involved and what needs there are in your campus. Will you welcome your campus uh, pastor or host to the stage right now? I hope you've heard that that you're indispensable, and regardless of your ability, God wants to use your availability. And we have so many different opportunities, no matter what your availability is. You might be here thinking, man, I I don't have that much time. Now, does it require two hours a week or 10 hours a week or an hour a week or 30 minutes a week? Whatever your availability is, there's opportunities for you to serve here. And let me give you some practical ways to, to get the process started. There's a QR code that you can scan. You can also text the word serve to the number 72020. That's serve to 72020. We'll follow up with you. But some of you here today, uh, you don't need to use technology or text somebody. You need to go talk to somebody. And I want you to know if you're here at the Peoria campus, all throughout our campuses, there are tents set up. It might say guest services on them, might say stars on them, but wherever you see a tent, there'll be somebody there that would love to talk to you more about what it means to serve. If you're online right now, there's a link in the, in the chat below. You can click on that. We'll follow up with you with all the different opportunities that you can get plugged in and serve. Listen, as you're thinking about serving, don't, don't do it just because we need you to do it. Do it because God wants to use you through it. Okay, CCV, thank you so much for being here this week. And God bless you. I hope you know you're indispensable. Have a great week.